Hello, and welcome to the sixth lecture in our fifth anniversary spring lecture series. My name is Deborah Hurd. I am the project coordinator for the Department of Black Studies 50th anniversary here at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. And this webinar series is a part of the department's year long celebration of that milestone. In 1968, the first Department of Black Studies was established at San Francisco State University. Its founding was the result of several years of protests and demands by Black students for a course of study and approaches to research that reflected the cultural and social understandings of Black people globally and historically, but which also provided a means for improving the current lives of those same people. Then, as now, it was a time of social reckoning and accountability. That reckoning made its way to Omaha, Nebraska, and like at San Francisco State and other campuses around the country, Black students at UNO demanded to be acknowledged and their experiences recognized, and so the protests began. Then, on November 10th, 1969, 54 Black UNO students staged a sit-in in the President's office for his failure to address issues of racial discrimination and cultural relevance on this campus. While peacefully protesting, the police were called and all of the students were arrested. The arrest of the Omaha 54 gave not only the student population, but also Omaha's Black community a cause to rally around. Omaha's Black civic and social organizations and churches came together to bail out all of the Omaha 54 students, as well as stand behind them in their, in their negotiations with the university. One of their demands was the creation of a Department of Black Studies. And two years later, as a result of their continued demands of the university administration, in the fall of 1971, this department came into existence, making it one of the oldest Black Studies departments in this country and one of the very few in the entire Great Plains region. And here we are, 50 years later, honoring the courage and tenacity of the Omaha 54 and the unwavering commitment of Omaha's Black community. We honor you and we thank you. As a discipline that studies, analyzes, and critiques the continuing effects of historical enslavement, colonization, land dispossession, and corporate imperialism, we must stop to acknowledge that this university and the very city itself sits on the sacred tribal lands of the Native American people for whom this city is named, the Omaha, and that of other First Nation people who regarded this land as their communal homeland. We stand in solidarity with you. Finally, our thoughts and prayers go out to the people of Ukraine who find themselves besieged with war, fighting, and death all around. We pray, pray for their safety and an end to the occupation and fighting that is destroying their peace and their lives. We also pray for the safety of the thousands of African, Indian, and other immigrant students who, while fleeing the terror and violence for neighboring, neighboring borders, like hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians, they were stopped by police and border patrol agents and prohibited from boarding trains, buses, or merely walking across a border to safety. We pray for the safety and security of all of the people caught up in this war. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for the evening, Dr. Andrew Eisen. Dr. Eisen is a visiting assistant professor of history and the assistant director of the honors program at Stetson University in Deland, Florida. He earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in history and Latin American studies from Lake Forest College in Lake Forest, Illinois, and master's and PhD degrees in history from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. While a graduate student, Dr. Eisen had his first experience teaching in a prison with the Education Justice Project at the University of Illinois. In 2015, he co-founded the Community Education Project with two other Stetson University professors. The Community Education Project is a higher education in prison program offering liberal arts instruction at the Tomoka Correctional Institution in Florida. He has also helped to organize the first gathering of Southern prison higher education programs. Since 2018, Dr. Eisen has collaborated with incarcerated scholars to challenge entrenched, entrenched narratives on slavery 
and the forced removal of Native Americans in East Florida. This has culminated in the creation of a traveling exhibit focused on histories of resistance to settler violence. So welcome, Dr. Eisen. Thank you so much for having me. It's an All honor right. to be here. So before we get started, I have a few questions to ask you, uh, just conversational questions. Uh, what got you interested in studying history? Yeah, um, so I think my my experience probably wasn't atypical uh, of many. Uh, it was um, one undergraduate class, um, one professor um, who seemed to be asking the kinds of questions that I wanted answered um, and not answering them for us, but giving us the tools to understand our social world. Um, it was um, during the time of the Iraq war, um, protests happening uh, around campus, uh, and really um, th this one professor, Steve Rossworm, was a labor historian um, whose, cla whose classes were addressing the questions I wanted answered. Um, he was asking things like, why was there such disparity in wealth in the United States? What were the root causes and histories of, of racism and white supremacy in the country? Uh, who benefited from them? And most importantly to me as an undergraduate at the time, coming of age, as I said, during the Iraq war, how did people um, resist historically to injustices? Uh, and what did those kinds of stories tell us? Or what kind of uh, pathways did, did those stories provide us um, for those uh, who were um, uh, protesting uh, war and white supremacy uh, at the turn of the 21st century. Okay, so how did you get involved in prisoner education? Yeah, um, so this uh, happened when I was a graduate student at the University of Illinois. Uh, I was a PhD student for far too long um, and was struggling to finish my dissertation, trying to find that motivation for that last push to complete a degree at a time when there weren't many jobs available. Um, this was right uh, at the moment of the housing crisis um, and the job market, which wasn't very robust before that, just completely fell off. Um, and so um, uh, my, uh, my partner uh, was teaching at with the uh, Education Justice Project run by Dr. Rebecca Ginsburg. Uh, and she encouraged me to uh, to work in what was called the Language Partners Program. And so I'm a historian uh, going into an ESL classroom where the other instructors are incarcerated folks. So they're incarcerated men teaching uh, English as a second language to Latin American migrants. Um, and as a historian, I felt at first like, why are you inviting me to do this? I don't have any tools to, to teach language. Um, but what I was able to do was to work with the incarcerated instructors to implement Mexican American history and Latin American history into their ESL, um, into their ESL classes. Um, and it really, um, it, the, the folks who were doing the teaching were uh, very invested in not only their teaching, but also in social history. And so um, that was kind of a, a moment that sparked in me that Historians have a lot of things that they can do in different ways to engage with the public. Um, and, and those folks who are incarcerated um, um, and working within the prison just kind of also gave me to kind of finish the story, kind of gave me that motivation to, to say, hey, this is what I want to do for my career uh, and gave me the, that last push to uh, finish the dissertation finally, which uh, my dissertation advisors were very happy about. Okay, so the that that triggered another question. Uh, this isn't the third question; just to sure. add on to the, the second question. Um, so the the language instructors you say were incarcerated. Mm -hmm. Were the the migrants were they incarcerated as well, or they were they? Yeah, so they were, um, yeah, a good question. Um, yeah, so they were other folks who were incarcerated in the prison and um, the, uh, they, the Latin American migrants who were inside of the prison uh, would be awaiting deportation. But while they were incarcerated, many of them were eager to learn English um, because that's how the prison functioned. And so, you know, different classes and stratas are created within the prison based on language and language injustices. And so um, the, the higher ed and prison program um, the idea came from an incarcerated uh, student with EJP who said, hey, we, sh we have these skills to teach um, and uh, we should use them uh, to benefit those other folks who are incarcerated. Okay. 
Um, so the last question I'll ask, and then I will kind of like turn it over to you, is how did you get started with this particular history project? Right. So um, as um, as you mentioned in the introduction, uh, when I uh, moved down to Florida, we started a higher ed in prison program uh, here uh, in Central Florida, and um, there was kind of two real um, um, kind of motivating uh, factors here. Um, the, the first was the incredible, incredible research being conducted by incarcerated women at the Indiana Women's Prison. Uh, for the past eight years, they had be, they've been studying local histories of women's prisons. Uh, and in fact, we'll be publishing a book uh, about their research with Dr. Elizabeth Nelson uh, later on this year, I believe. Uh, we'll be screening a short documentary film. It's about 19 minutes long here in just a moment uh, where, that talks about the work uh, of the, the women working with IWP. So that was um, kind of, I, I saw their model and thought, that this was something that um, we could use um, at the prison uh, where I was teaching, um, and the the second um, the the second was uh, Taya Miles' uh, work with undergraduate students on the Cherokee Rose Plantation. Um, Dr. Miles um, has um, published uh, or uh, had undergraduate students uh, doing uh, primary research on. Uh, plantations. And so those are the kind of the two things that really sparked uh, in, in me the, um, the, the idea, uh, along with our incarcerated students, um, who, um, as I'll talk about uh, here uh, in the lecture, uh, were very eager to get involved. And then um, I guess with that, uh, I wanted to just very briefly introduce the, the the documentary film, as I mentioned, uh, we we made this in I think 2019. Um, this was before COVID hit. Uh, Dr. Uh, Nelson and I uh, produced the film. Uh, you'll see, uh, you'll get introduced to our students as well as uh, some of her um, students who um, who are uh, uh, alumni of the program. And so um, we'll screen the film, and then afterwards I'll uh, talk for another 20, 25 minutes about some of the work that has happened since, and then really eager to uh, have a conversation with uh, everyone here. The history project means to me resistance in its most extreme fashion. It's giving voice to the voiceless, and that includes myself. The following tells the story of formerly and currently incarcerated researchers from college and prison programs who study history to challenge entrenched narratives within their communities. In the Community Education Project, or CEP, faculty from Florida Stetson University offer courses at the Tomoka Correctional Institution. What began as a reading group in 2015 has transformed into a liberal arts program that as of 2019 offers about 20 men at the facility the opportunity to earn college credits. I am Wellington Antonio Rosa. I've been incarcerated 20, going on 21 years, and I've been in CEP now three years, working on the public history project for a year, going on two years. In 2018, after learning how poorly nearby plantations document the lives of enslaved persons in their public exhibits, a group of CEP students began researching local histories of slavery and Indian removal in East Florida, focusing their attention on the Spring Garden Plantation located about 20 miles from the prison. Following the Civil War, the site became a tourist attraction and in the 1980s was transformed into the De Leon Springs State Park. It's something that has this uh, aura of history that's supposedly so great. You know, Ponce de Leon came here. This was the Fountain of Youth, which is all fabricated. It's spun like this capitalist idea that, hey, let's make money. But here's a history of not just one type of people, you know, enslaved, but also, you know, the indigenous. We have, you know, tribes that were displaced. I'm fourth 
maybe fifth generation Floridian from the Central Florida area. I started looking into specific facts about the Indian removal and I came to learn that uh, there was a Seminoles Indian chief by the name of Uchi Billy that had villages literally in my backyard. CEP students conduct their research using primary documents, such as inventory lists, census records, and diaries. With research assistance from Stetson faculty, CEP students have recovered the names of more than 200 people held in bondage at the plantation. The first document I transcribed of the Eliza Williams diary, it was like a puzzle. You know, I'm very interested in puzzles, and it drove me deeper into, you know, studying history. The History Project at Tomoka CI was inspired by a similar initiative at the Indiana Women's Prison, or IWP. The former IWP Higher Education Program Director, Dr. Kelsey Kaufman, began the History Project in 2013 as a graduate level nine-degree program for students ready to pursue advanced work. In this program, students research the history of the IWP, which opened in 1873 and is widely regarded as the first separate facility for women in the United States. There are currently five students active in the history project inside the Indiana Women's Prison. However, our requests to film at the facility were denied. We will be hearing from three women who have continued their studies after being released from the prison. I knew that um, I wanted to study history my whole life. It was a coincidence that IWP offered the History Project and uh, I jumped at the chance. The History Project got me really with my mind and my thinking outside of the prison. Researching and writing and then presenting our findings in conferences, being invited to do other talks that had nothing to do with the History Project, just on higher education in prison and in mass incarceration, being able to then publish things. It was huge in, in terms of thinking about life on the outside and then that History Project actually gave me the um, support to then be thinking about like what would my life be like once I got home. Well, you know, that's a funny thing. I've been the one member of this group the entire time that has said, uh, I'm not a historian, I'm not trying to be a historian. But the crazy thing is that somewhere along the line, um, I guess I actually am a historian. Hello, my name is Anastasia Schmidt, and I'll be presenting Sexual Conquest in 19th Century Institutions. Dr. Theophilus Parvin. Early on, the Indiana researchers uncovered evidence of physical abuse perpetrated by the prison's Quaker founders, Rhoda Coffin and Sarah Smith. Coffin and Smith had been portrayed in previous historical accounts as benevolent reformers, but the students in the History Project have convincingly demonstrated prisons for women were characterized by gendered violence from the very start. Can we really consider these people feminists? When you are attacking your own kind and what you are really doing is nothing more than what we were just talking about, solidifying the power structure already in place, in this case, patriarchy, mm -hmm. male dominance, male privilege, male rule. Since 2013, the IWP researchers have expanded their reach to other institutions, such as a state-sponsored girls' school a Catholic-run Magdalene Laundry in Indianapolis, and state schools for the so-called feeble-minded. All of these facilities confine women and girls in Indiana in the late 19th and early 20th centuries largely to control their sexuality and reproduction. The researchers in the Florida and Indiana Project share a commitment to telling the stories that previous historians have overlooked. Most of our history you learn is not about over 90% of the population of the history of the world. We all we hear about is the political leaders, and, um, you know, the important people of history. We don't hear about the common person. And to me, that's, that is history, the common people. 
critiquing local history through feminist histories, African American history, minority histories, I think we might have a chance of opening the door to like all these other plantations that tell history from a political perspective that really aggrandizes, you know, the enslavers. How about looking at it through all these other lenses of history? So I'm thinking that Spring Garden might become the first of its kind, and then maybe it'll allow us to revisit all these other plantations that are written from a majority perspective. It's about looking at the entire puzzle and the big picture and not just one piece. It's about filling in the blanks. It's about taking the thing that's been on the fringes and in the margins and sometimes the thing that wasn't on the table at all and picking it up and breathing a little breath of life right back into it and saying, yeah, it's real and it's valid. Finding marginalized voices in the archives can be difficult due to missing or non-existent documentation. One of the limitations I would say is gaps in the information that we have. You wonder why yeah. the testimony mm -hmm. from the 1881 investigation is missing from the Indiana archives. Full, full testimony mm -hmm. missing from the 1887 investigation as well. Mm -hmm. Yet, Jeffersonville's 1869 investigation, 1873 investigation. I have both of those. And the only records mm -hmm. that we have of like what actually happened in these, in these hearings we have because of newspaper accounts. Sources that do exist are often written by the powerful and must be read against the grain to recover the experiences of the less powerful. The people that we're writing about did not write about themselves. We were having to rely on other people writing about them. So that, that's the way it sticks out to me. And also that we have so few documents of Spring Garden. We're ha we have a, a wealth of documents of other plantations or secondary sources, things that happened around them, but things that happened at Spring Garden had the documents of. And I think this is a challenge of a lot of historians, mm -hmm. right, of, re, uh, of creating that voice. Some historians have developed actual research methodologies around it. I think about um, Callie Gross's idea of the informed speculation, mm -hmm. where she says, I take the bits that I have using the context within it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I fill in the gaps. Doing historical research inside a prison presents a unique set of challenges. Well, we can't do the research that is you know, that a normal historian, historian would do because we're limited with our ability to search through archives. It was kind of funny because uh, we all knew, we were, uh, uh, have one locker in between our two bunks and the sun used to come in and I had an old pair of glasses and he'd be trying to find something, figure something out. So we, we put it on that locker and take my glasses and use them for a magnifying glass. <laughs> And we learned a lot of stuff that way. <laughs> Can I just say that I, one of the beautiful things that I've been able to feel since I've, we've all been out of prison is to go to the archive myself. So my, yeah. I had that feeling you too. Know, the first time I went and I was sitting there and it, I was like, oh my gosh, I've talked about this and yeah. thought about being able to do this and I can't believe I'm actually here and I was so happy. I took, we took pictures. I yeah. put on the gloves and everything. I was like, oh my gosh, we're here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because we have been receiving Everything on these research questions, you know, secondhand. Yeah, right? yeah. We've mm -hmm. been asking questions of them, waiting weeks, mm -hmm. waiting weeks, waiting months for them to give us back stuff. But to go and then just to kind of swim through, go page by page yeah. and scan mm -hmm. and look names, and then have the have the story, so I know what I'm looking for. Right. Myself. Yes. Right, was golden. Part of why we have been able to excavate the information we have is because we have the lived experience. Yeah. yeah. We are those people. Being incarcerated has taken away some of the liberties that a lot of people on the street take for granted. As a lifer in prison, um, when you first come in, you're, you're told, hey, you're the property of DOC. You're made to feel that you don't matter. You know. You know, you're given a label inmate, you know, and it means that they can treat you any kind of way. And We're given a number. We're told when to eat, when to go to sleep. We're not considered um, <clears throat> human. 
you know, in a sense. These are some of the same experiences that I've learned that so many enslaved people at these plantations have endured as well. Also family separation, they're separated from their families, we're separated from our families. I've seen parallels between the way we're treated and the way that, you know, the enslaved are treated. So I've used this project as a way of, if not bringing justice to my situation, bringing justice to the people that were enslaved. When I do my research, you know, which is family separation, I miss my family. You know, and I, and, and, and I can, and I relate right in that, in that sense right there. So that most of the, the kids were sent to Charleston. As a historian, I know that I can't uh, make assumptions about how they feel or what they think about being in this institution. I Me mean, personally would be outraged and um, depressed, upset, uh, distraught over being sent there, but I don't feel like I can assume that about them. I want you to feel that you are in a privileged place as yes. a person who has had that lived experience and pr epistemically privilege your right mm -hmm. to look at that same archive that other people have looked at and come up with a different story. What I'm doing now is, is, is going over what they wrote, what they wrote, you know, and, and, and other primary documents, you know, and, and writing my own story. How many people will automatically not hear a single word we have to say solely because of where we once were? Mm -hmm. There's still work, you know, in people that have been sentenced to a lot of time or even to die in prison. My goal is to take the research and take the findings and put them in um, packaging for the broad, for a broad audience. And one of the things that I initially worked on, focused on when we got the lab set up was transcribing the names of the enslaved people. A lot of those names made it to back to Stetson University and earlier this year we had a tour there with history students who actually stood at Spring Garden and read those names. And it was probably the first time that those names had been read in over a century on the site where they were enslaved. So that's one way of giving back. I have produced a photography artist installation recently that took my research on stigma and my research on the weaponization of stigma and turned it into a, pho a photographic art exhibition. Anastasia and I have taken the history project and the stories of Rhoda and Sarah and the prostitutes in the city of Indianapolis and turned that into a play. Congratulations on receiving the Jefferson Award. It also means something that I'm giving back to the community um, at large, that we're doing something productive. Um, I'm not sitting idly by, uh, just biding my time until I get released. And all day Monday, we can dedicate to trying to finish some of this stuff up. And then we start doing our next paper for you. That too. <laughs> we now are doing four credit classes. I think it's really good. I got out of high school in 1977. Never taken any schooling since then, and I'm maintaining a B average at Stetson University. The History Project has meant several things for me. First and foremost for my personal life, it has given me a second chance at um, a future career uh, education opportunities that when I was at my lowest, I wasn't sure that I was going to have again. Another thing is, um, it's given me an opportunity to break the stereotype of what a person is capable of doing in prison. Uh, they say, okay, you're a lifer, so let's warehouse you and, and keep you alive until you die. And, um, you know, I, I think this project has given me the opportunity to challenge that. My whole thing is like, what am I making so that people can use it right now? I have actually changed my whole entire dissertation project based on how can what I'm going to do be usable for people sitting in prison right now. And if it's not going to be usable for people sitting in prison right now, then I need to stop what I'm doing. From this program, that's what I would like to see, you know, go to other prisons and give other guys the opportunity to be a part of something like this. For me, this, this has been the greatest, great experience. You know, one of the greatest that, I, I mean, despite the fact of it being in prison, one of the best I've ever had. I always make an emphasis to say, look, we might be doing stuff. And it's cool, because we cool. Mm -hmm. But we're not an anomaly. Exceptionalizing mm -hmm. who we are and what we do 
is a disservice in, yes. in a way. Yes. If yeah. you give access to resources and opportunities mm-hmm. to every damn body else mm-hmm. who has had a, who has had a similar experience, mm-hmm. nine times out of ten they will show up mm-hmm. and show out mm-hmm. as well. Thank you so much for showing that. So uh, I'm going to take about the next 20 minutes or so and talk a little bit about our program and uh, where we have grown since um, the time of um, that this video was produced and give just a little bit of background about the work um, and where it emerged from. So I'm going to share my screen. And uh, I'm going to assume that it is up and working unless told otherwise. Um, and so um, Here's just a, a bit of information about uh, our work uh, and the, um, the role of the program um, at our university. Um, when I first began teaching at Tomoka CI more than six years ago, I had a black student in his mid sixties, Robert, who approached me about wanting to learn more about African-American history. Except for a few brief weeks when he was 18, Robert had spent his entire life in prison since he was 13 years old. Over the course of a few months, Robert and I would speak about history, our conversations ranging from redlining to the civil rights movement to how prisons had changed in the decades that he had lived in them. While Robert had engaged in a lot of self-study, it was clear he was eager to discuss these ideas with me, and more importantly, to have greater access to reading materials to help him better understand his history. One day, he shared with me a homemade book on Black history that someone in his dorm had made, a collection of stories and photographs ripped from books and encyclopedias, newspaper clippings, and internet printouts that loved ones must have, have sent in the prison. It was at this point, paging through the histories, I began to more fully grapple with the desire that some incarcerated students, especially those from marginalized backgrounds, uh, had to learn about their own histories. Um, here you can see a photo of our classroom uh, and our mission, which is to offer quality liberal arts education and learning opportunities in Florida prisons with the belief that access to the liberal arts education offers incarcerated individuals meaningful opportunities for personal growth and intellectual engagement, uh, which in turn benefits our community as a whole. Um, with the history project, um, it came to be that um, they could help our students better understand how racial legacies of criminalization have informed modern day incarceration, uh, one of the things that they are interested in. As Brian Stevenson, director of the, Edu the Equal Justice Initiative Rights in the 1619 Project, quote, slavery gave America a fear of Black people and a taste for violent punishment, both still define the criminal justice system, end quote. The lesson that I took from Robert's homemade book on Black history, the scholarship on the legacies, uh, on how the legacies of slavery continued to shape policing and incarceration in this country, as well as the histories of the local histories of slavery and incarceration in Volusia County, where we live, all inform the historical research that we conduct uh, inside. In Black Reconstruction, published in 1935, W.E.B. Du Bois writes, quote, our histories tend to discuss American slavery so impartially that in the end, nobody seems to have done wrong and everybody was right. Slavery appears to have been thrust upon unwilling, helpless America while the South was blameless in becoming its center. One is astonished in the study of history at the reoccurrence of the idea that evil must be forgotten, distorted, skimmed over, end quote. Nearly 100 years later, the same largely holds true of the interpretive histories provided at former plantation sites in Florida. 
When I first moved to Florida in 2014, I was appalled by how the histories of slavery depicted um, were depicted at former plantations. At the De Leon Springs State Park, located about 20 miles from the prison, there were only two panels that mentioned slavery at what had been the Spring Garden Plantation. Both of these panels were sympathetic to enslavers. I found one line in particular infuriating. The exhibit claimed the, quote, names of the slaves are long forgotten, end quote. As a historian, I realized that the person who wrote these histories either did not know how to locate the records or simply did not care enough to look. With a simple Google search, I quickly found a slave ledger with the names of more than 30 men, women, and children enslaved at the Spring Garden Plantation. In 2018, I took, photos, I took photos of the exhibit and gave a presentation about the public history of slavery in Volusia County to the incarcerated students in our program. A few of the men asked what I intended to do uh, about it. Um, and this is how our public research collective was formed. Antonio, one of the researchers you heard from, explains in the following, quote, enslavers used their power to produce records to secure their wealth and bequeath it to the next generation of enslavers. They generated inventory lists, bills of sales, deeds, wills, and journals in which they commodified enslaved persons. This, these, same record, these same records silenced them by representing them as chattel as opposed to persons suffering an injustice. Available plantation records representing the dominative dominant discourse of a slaveholding society failed to tell us anything meaningful about enslaved subjectivities and lived experiences. Enslaved persons at Spring Garden Plantation deprived of, liter deprived of literacy lacked the political power and ability to create records of their lives. But by reading records against the grain, Stetson CEP's public history project is teasing out lived experience from the slaveholders' silences. Contrary to the park's claim that their names are long forgotten, our research has recovered the names of over 200 enslaved persons spanning a period of about 60 years. Um, here is the traveling exhibit that the men in our program made. One of the items that we're most excited about is our ability to bring our students' research outside of the prison. You saw in the video one example, when I gave tours of the former plantation in my classes, I'm now able to share with students the names and stories of ind individuals that incarcerated researchers have recovered from the archives. At the state park now, the two main attractions are the spring where people uh, go and swim and the quote, uh, or the, what, what they refer to as the old Spanish sugar mill, which is a pancake house. When I toured the plantation, we found a quiet, when I, when I toured the plantation with my students at Stetson, we found a quiet space on a trail far away from the Pancake House's loudspeaker uh, and read the names out loud of the people who had um, been enslaved there, honoring those who had lived, labored, and died on the plantation. Uh, that experience remains one of the most powerful teaching and learning experiences I've ever had as an educator. In addition, students inform the public about their work uh, through their research. Antonio and Pete, who were also who were in the video, uh, wrote a blog post that explained in more detail uh, their their efforts at uh, recording and finding and interpreting history. I'll post the link the link um, into the chat um, after uh, the, this portion of the talk. Um, we are also now excited to be able to share the research the men in our program conducted in this exhibit that you see on the screen. The men split up into research groups studying a variety of different items, uh, the origins of the plantation, family separation, food cultivation, the Second Seminole War, how different imperial regimes shaped experiences of the enslaved. And we had, um, we had a professor in our digital arts program, Madison Creech, teach design at the prison to support the effort. And so uh, the men work together, they split up into groups and then they design the exhibit themselves with support of a digital arts professor. Um, it might be hard to see, but the photo on the left shows the side of the display that reads, this exhibit honors the men, women and children recorded as having been enslaved at the Spring Garden Plantation. You are not forgotten. Beneath is a list of more than 200 names the men have helped to recover. In the photo on the right, you can see family members of our students who came out to the public event to see their work. Such opportunities for community engagement do not come often for people who are incarcerated. 
Four of the six men involved in our project have life sentences. And so the ability to give back to the community, as Ken mentioned in the video, is particularly important for them, as is being able to share their successes with family members. Now, I think it's important to note that students are not just recovering names, but are also starting to tell stories about Black freedom uh, in Volusia County that uh, had otherwise been unknown. Uh, Thomas Stark was the enslaver at, Spring Garden at the Spring Garden Plantation at the time of the Civil War. In his probate records, we have found the list of enslaved persons and their monetary value. Um, and here um, I'm noting with this red arrow, uh, Anthony Stark, um, who was valued at the time at uh, $600. And so um, the men have been tracing these histories and piecing them together and um, finding um, finding uh, important histories of Black freedom uh, that, uh, that uh, include uh, the stories like Anthony's, who in the aftermath of the war uh, helped to found and build a small Black um, uh, community near Enterprise known as Garfield, uh, including the AME church there. In 1867, Anthony appears again in the public records as a registered voter. Um, so the students are kind of grappling with this idea of someone uh, whose family would have endured the second middle passage, who himself uh, would have been um, experienced um, the, the, the violence uh, of slavery for the majority of his life, who was then casting a ballot uh, during radical reconstruction. Uh, while Anthony Stark's freedom story is now beginning to be known, and it, um, it's something that Antonio discusses at length uh, in the uh, traveling exhibit, uh, his remains are buried out of sight. Um, so in this slide, you can see um, uh, kind of this wooded area where the Garfield set Settlement Cemetery um, has been abandoned. Um, and I went out there uh, with a colleague of mine, Bob Sittler, uh, and um, um, put flowers by the grave sites that uh, we encountered there, um, but we're hoping that uh, perhaps in the future we're able to do something more than that um, to recognize this uh, important cultural site. Uh, in addition, um, through the examination of probate records, census records, and newspaper accounts from a local museum, uh, our student Mercury traced the history of another person who was enslaved at the plantation, Malia Stark. Um, to uh, a living uh, uh, relative, Mr. Leon Clements. Uh, in this photo here, I'm sharing a collection um, that, um, or a booklet with uh, a letter of introduction from the researchers, as well as the documents um, that we have about Malia Stark uh, and um, where she lived and um, um, to provide that information to Mr. Clements uh, who, was able to learn more about his family's past um, that he didn't uh, know about until uh, our students uh, were uh, able to share this information with him. Um, recently, I've even begun to hear from descendants of some of the enslavers at the Spring Garden Plantation uh, who have come across our students' research publications on live. Um, some of, and I, if this is of interest, I can talk about it in the Q&A, some of those um, experiences um, have been uh, better than others um, in terms of the, the respect for the research, et cetera. Um, I, I do want to uh, conclude here in, in just a moment. I've got uh, two more slides uh, and I wanna have time for Q&A. So um, I wanna talk a little bit about um, what our program has been up to uh, in, uh, in the time since the video uh, was completed. You saw the traveling exhibit uh, that was uh, completed. We show those uh, at a, we, we showed them uh, at a, a local museum, at art galleries. Uh, earlier this year, uh, our program was awarded a grant to create a food studies program at the prison. Uh, you can see the uh, garden beds that we installed there. And um, part of the grant is to, um, create this learning landscape that we're incorporating into the history project. Uh, for the past few months, uh, students have been growing tomatoes, peppers, okra, and herbs that um, they're going to be and have been donating to the prison's kitchen to enhance diets. Um, 
And uh, earlier this summer, our garden manager, Rick Wheatley, visited the nearby Bulow Plantation, um, where indigo continues to uh, grow wild. Um, it's a, an invasive species. It's, uh, indigo was one of the major cash crops in the 18th century British East Florida. Uh, and so with permission of a park ranger, Rick harvested the indigo seeds and uh, uh, we're currently growing the, uh, the indigo on the, the grounds of the prison. Uh, we're going to be harvesting those seeds and, and students are going to write stories about the history of indigo in the area. Um, and um, hopefully this summer we'll have a chance to do some seed exchanges with local community gardens, um, farmers markets to kind of to um, bring awareness uh, to this history. Um, it's, a, it's a strange experience living in Central Florida where folks uh, oftentimes make claims that um, Florida isn't part of the South. Um, and so um, I think this is one of the reasons why we get such poor local histories. Um, um, and uh, as you can see in this slide, for example, um, this is me giving a tour at a plantation, uh, the, the Dunlawton plantation. Uh, it's referred to as a um, sugar mill garden now. Um, and um, it is kind of an example. It's not just the spring garden plantation where the histories are so poorly told. Um, but here in this part of Florida, um, there during the Second Seminole War, more than a dozen plantations were burned down. Um, and what remains of them um, are um, well, many of these properties are now owned by the state and they have um, very poor records of telling uh, the stories of enslaved persons. Um, Dun the Dunlawton Plantation, for example, uh, in the 1950s became a theme park called Bongo Land, um, which included caged baboons and um, and uh, large concrete dinosaurs. And so in the present, the, um, the former plantation site is now uh, a, a garden uh, and they really lean on this history of the dinosaurs and not noting that it was a Jim Crow tourist destination, not noting that this was a plantation that was burnt down. Um, I gave this tour here uh, earlier this year in January. Um, uh, using research from our students and um, presenting it to MFA students at Stetson, uh, some of whom were kind of visibly upset that they had been taking their children to this area for years and didn't know that they were on the site um, of a former plantation. Um, and so what I'd like to do as just a conclusion is um, just to, to think about the stakes of this research and what it means to some of our students. I want to read, it's about a page long, so bear with me. It's from um, Antonio, but I think it's a powerful, uh, it's a powerful um, note about what the research means to him. Um, and so uh, I, will, uh, I will go ahead and read that now as a conclusion. According to Marissa Fuentes, the author of Dispossessed Lives, enslaved persons are silenced in the archives by the narrative told by their recorders. They are not allowed to tell their own stories. The quote, violent systems and structures of white supremacy created devastating images, end quote, of enslaved people that erased them and led to their social death. What we can know about them is limited by what and how those in power decided to document about them. In a previous paper for an ASH conference, I mentioned that I was drawn to the Public History Research Collective because of the similarities between enslavement and modern incarceration. Thinking of the likeness within the context of Marissa Fuentes' discussion of the archive has led me to explore a deeper motivation for partaking in this project, my desire to buck against the narrative imposed on me by the penal system. Since my incarceration two decades ago, my footprint on society has ceased. Instead, my life has been lived within the legal and correctional archives. The legal archive began with my arrest report and my mugshot. I then made a brief appearance in court records. Since then, certain aspects of my life have been documented on my contact card, a record of minor infractions kept in my dormitory officer's station, and disciplinary record within the Florida Department of Corrections database. The department does not record positive activities other than educational and vocational programs from which lifers are largely excluded. 
My achievements as a self-directed learner and my personal growth are completely ignored by these archives. I have heard of prisoners stand before parole and clemency boards with squeaky clean disciplinary records and shiny resumes of program completions only to have those achievements considered suspect. As a convicted felon serving life sentences, how will my story be told by a historian searching through available records decades from now? As a lifer, it is expected that I will not have anything meaningful to contribute to society or academia. The Florida Department of Corrections suspects that men like me are either violent gang members. Up until earlier this year, I was listed as a member of a security threat group because of a sergeant's claim that I admitted membership to him or a drug user, the department routinely, routinely administers random drug tests. My decision to avoid drug use, violence, and gang membership are directly related to my desire to define my identity against the expectations of corrections professionals. My pursuit of higher education through self-directed studies and now as a Stetson CEP student is integral to my self-definition. My submissions for academic conferences, articles for process history, and work on the Public History Research Collective's exhibit on the Spring Garden Plantation are opportunities to leave my own trace in academic and public archives that expand the narratives that may be told about me in the negative legal and correctional archives. While I can't extricate myself from the prison industrial complex, I am challenging the narratives that are propagated by it. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. That just just the, the statement that you ended with is, is so powerful um, that it, it really makes you reconsider all of the things that you think you know about the, the penal system and what it's designed to do. Um, so yeah, so let me we we do have a question in the QA. So I'll let I'll do that first before I present any questions that I may have. Um, and if anyone else has any questions, you can put them in the QA. Um, so we have a question from, from Yoli and Gandali. What were some of the reactions of the wider community in these public exhibits? Um, so I'll, I'll be honest, they, they were pretty mixed. Um, there weren't, um, um, let, let me start with the positive. Um, there were, um, um, as I mentioned, our, our students' family members were able to come out. Um, and um, that to me was uh, kind of exceptionally important um, that uh, the, the men in our program, as I mentioned, four of the six um, have life sentences. And so um, there's very few ways for uh, incarcerated folks to engage in civic, uh, um, civic engagement. Um, and so, um, our students are rightfully very proud of their work, uh, have been doing this for a long time, spent hours and hours transcribing documents. Um, Antonio um, uh, transcribed an 80 page um, Spanish language um, document that um, was uh, poorly scanned and printed out and um, they, they don't have the kind of resources that a normal historian would have. And he not only um, transcribed it and then he, um, translated it so the other members of our collective could read it and understand it. Um, and so kind of those stories um, and, and having the families um, see their work was uh, really uh, gratifying. And I, I think the men in our program are rightfully very proud of that. Um, when I've presented at, in some places, I always have, it's, it's always a mix. I, I always have some folks who come out and um, tell me, you know, I've lived in Florida for X number of years. I had no idea that we were surrounded by plantations. I had gone to the Pancake House. I had gone to Bongo Land. I had gone, and I had no idea that the this was part of um, the, the history of this place. Um, and so that is um, always, um, uh, always, um, I like to bring those stories in and, and tell the students that because I, I, almost everything that they learn about how the exhibit goes is filtered through me, right? Um, 
they don't have access to the internet. Um, they, they, um, I, I print out things, I bring them in, uh, stories about the project I, I share with them, but um, they, they, they're pretty reliant on the information that I bring in. And so I, I'm grateful to be able to bring in those positive stories. Um, sometimes I'll give a talk and someone will write a nice note afterwards and I can share it with them and, and that's meaningful. Um, but then because we are living uh, as we always are in a contentious time, uh, one in which, um, uh, white supremacy is on the march. Um, I, I get a lot of pushback, um, not pushback on the history because the history is sound. Uh, the, the men have uh, documented their work. They have um, um, footnotes for all of the claims that they are making and we share them, the resources, where the information comes from. What, they, what uh, the public doesn't like is that, um, that it is making them think about this place that they love, uh, and here I'm talking about white folks, um, in a way that um, that they don't want to think about. Um, they don't want to think about the the histories of violence uh, in the land that we um, that we currently inhabit. Um, they don't want to think about the abandoned cemeteries and and why those exist. They don't want to um, uh, think about the, the the violence of chattel slavery and the the wealth that was built in this area because of it and who was left behind. Um, and so. Um, that discomfort um, is often couched um, in trying to get us to modify how we tell the story. Um, so they what what they won't make any claims that the history is wrong. It, it's a question about emphasis. So why do you spend all the time on this part, but you don't talk about all of these other things? Is is what I normally um, uh, is is the the most civil critique I normally get. Um, other times when I'm giving tours, um, I've had people yell at me in the middle of tours, interrupt my talks. Um, we are in, um, we, you know, we're, we're in Central Florida uh, and um, people feel very strongly about how white people feel very strongly about how they see their roots in this area. And they feel, some have felt like this is an attack on them. Thank you for the question. So uh, let me back you up just a little bit because you you mentioned having to bring in um, the documents and Antonio having to to translate, but kind of walk us through because when when uh, I talked to you, um, I guess it was last summer when we all met. Um, there was a, a a long process because they didn't have internet, you know. Yeah. So the work that they did is phenomenal, but if you think about the resources that they had and what they had to do to actually get those names. Yeah. Um, so if you could explain that, because I, I think that the, um, to give our audience like a real sense of the real work that they had to do to get those names. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, the, the first thing is to say that um, when I visited the, um, the Spring Garden Plantation, now the De Leon Spring State Park, and there was this signage that said the names are long forgotten, uh, it took me probably 10 seconds to find the first set of names because I used Google, um, and the person who created the signage didn't. Um, and so that, 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 that was simple, right? I, I Googled Spring Garden Plantation um, and got a, a ledger and... Um, and um, um, had a, a list of names, um, brought those in, um, and the men, um, the, the men transcribed the ledgers, um, some of them were difficult to read, you, you may have seen on the um, screen of the, um, um, the exhibit, there's kind of question marks next to some of the names just because of, uh, it's hard to, to read uh, some of the items, um, so there's some, some names that came pretty quickly, um, we, um, and then others that were, that were much harder, um, so um, students, uh, Antonio uh, and Ken um, uh, transcribe diaries um, from um, people who lived around the plantation um, and uh, learned that one of the enslavers there had been loaning out uh, individuals, uh, had been renting out individuals for um, for a seasonal labor, essentially. And um, that was a common practice. And some of them, they found some names through, um, through um, the transcription of um, the the transcription of diaries from people who resided nearby the plantation, um, 
other uh, probate records um, that seven, eight pages of um, cursive that I would, again, uh, before we, it was easier once we got a computer lab. When we started, we didn't have a lab. So everything was printed out um, and then uh, the men would, uh, in their um, notebooks, would uh, would transcribe by hand. Um, uh, now, 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 that's where I want you to, to, to kind of flesh that out, yeah. because first of all, the deeds were in Spanish, right? Because they originally were, these were Spanish yeah. territories. So they yeah. had to translate from Spanish into English. Yeah, so they had uh, so they had to first uh, transcribe these um, these documents that um, were hard to read uh, on a computer, let alone on a printout. Uh, transcribe the Spanish and do a kind of like guesswork of what was there. And then once we got a computer lab, they went back over and reviewed the their transcriptions. But they were transcribed in Spanish um, when this was part of the you know, Spanish territory. Um, and then uh, Antonio, who is bilingual, uh, would kind of um, he would. Uh, uh, have little tags next to uh, anything that he knew that he needed to um, to um, then translate into English for folks who had kind of split up into these different groups. Um, and so it was a process. Um, you heard from Pete in the um, in in the video uh, about um, having a magnifying glass through a window and trying to read through uh, read read through these handouts. Um, it's not an experience most historians have had to endure um, in the present, right? Um, and so um, let me, I'm gonna put in the chat um, a, uh, a link uh, to, um, to a piece from Pete and Antonio, and they talk a little bit more in detail before we had the lab, I think, about what that process looked like. Okay. See, we have a couple more questions. Um, so Rosetta Cash asked, how can these types of programs for the incarcerated be conducted through universities, allowing the participants to obtain college credits or earn degrees? Yeah, a really great question. Um, it's hard. <laughs> um, we are able to run our program um, largely through grant funding. Um, and all of our program operations are uh, either from individual donors or through grant funding. Um, we began our program in 2015, uh, and there was nothing in the state like that at the time. Um, in 1994, Pell Grants were removed um, for people who were incarcerated, and so the, the college and prison programs that were largely um, community colleges um, had long um, 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 been taken out of the prisons because uh, they couldn't charge tuition, uh, and so there, it was pretty... Um, barren in terms of the kinds of uh, college programming in the state. And so when we started our program, we were the first four-year institution, liberal arts institution in the state um, that were, were working. And we had a goal and a vision to bring uh, credit-bearing programming and uh, would love to be able to do a degree-bearing project. Um, haven't been able to make that happen yet. Um, we're, we're lacking in resources, both um, kind of financial, but also uh, we work at a small liberal arts uh, institution and it's hard to get um, enough professors to go out um, and teach in the prison because uh, it's not like teaching. Um, I mean, in some ways, um, it, of course, it's a very rewarding experience, but there's a lot of hoops and obstacles that one has to go through in order to just get to the classroom. Um, COVID has made things uh, much um, more challenging. Um, the, the men in our program, they all live in dorms, and so they're, they're living um, with and around 70 other men. Um, and so um, um, during this most recent uh, uptick in um, COVID cases, we would go to the prison and all the dorms would be on lockdown except for one. And so we'd only have two, three students. And so um, we have a vision for trying to build out that project where we have more credit bearing programs, uh, pro credit bearing classes, um, have more um, uh, kind of work towards a degree bearing uh, uh, program, which is a goal, um, but uh, COVID has, um, has made that really challenging. Um, if there's questions about just higher education in prison more generally, uh, feel free, I'm, I'll put my email down here. I'm glad to chat and uh, uh, with anyone who, who might want to, to learn more and I can share resources. Okay. And, and uh, going back to the 
accessibility because you were saying or you had mentioned previously that when you first started they didn't have access to computers which was why they had to do all this transcription by hand but now that they have computers they they still don't have internet service is that right is that That's correct correct yeah and so um so uh and i also don't have access to the internet when i'm inside um and so the questions that um that uh, a historian would, you know, uh, there's a reference here and you don't know exactly where it's at, right? Um, and you, you want to find out where that, uh, where that road leads to because it, it, um, it, it's an integral part of the story that you're trying to tell. Like they might have to wait two or three days until I'm back at the prison and I had a chance to go to Google and print something out and the, the simplest of questions. And so we've been doing this for years. Um, and part of that reason is because um, everything takes longer. And I know uh, it's one of the frustrations that the, the men in our program feel I know is that um, they're we kind of living in an age of information uh, and uh, so much of their information is restricted. And that has, it takes, it takes longer to do things. Um, it takes um, longer to kind of double check and fact check things. Um, and, um, and so, um, yeah, the, the computers have been, incredibly helpful. Um, we were able to design the exhibit um, with, uh, with the support of faculty members um, with, uh, and wouldn't have been able to do that obviously with, without the computers, but um, we're, we're still very restricted in, in what, what uh, students have access to. Um, fortunately, when that piece came out from Antonio and Pete from Process History, um, uh, a number of historians reached out to us and sent us their books on slavery um, uh, that um, that we were then able to bring um, inside. And so uh, we have um, um, probably one of the best libraries on the histories uh, of slavery um, in certainly in our area, uh, and it's in the prison, uh, thanks to um, scholars sending in things and, and being able to purchase uh, books through grants, etc. Um, but that um, that there's still, and when you're doing that, like those local histories, that you can't discount the importance of uh, of Google and digital archives and, and local archives. That um, they're dependent on me to go out and do some of that work, um, finding um, finding um, uh, information and footnotes that they want me to track down. Um, and you know, I teach full time, and I, I'm and I am uh, assistant director of the honors program, and so they they're all often frustrated about the how long it takes me to get back to them with with items. Okay, um, so we have a question from Amy Schindler. She's our director of special collections uh, here in our library. Uh, in my own job in the cultural heritage section sector. I joined many colleagues in growing concerns about the over-reliance on unpaid, uncompensated labor by non-incarcerated students and volunteers. How do you continue to self-monitor and critique the labor that Antonio and the folks are undertaking without benefit of direct compensation or course credits? Um, so that's a really great question. Um, and um, I would say um, a few things. So the the men in our program um, do receive college credits, um, and uh, but not for this project. Um, in fact, it's one of the um, um, it, it, it's strange how the the ability to work with men over the course of a series of years uh, kind of is different than um, working in the undergrad. Uh, kind of the traditional undergraduate classes where you may have a semester with students, right? So we've been able to, um, uh, this is not um, a benefit of the prison system, just kind of uh, a description of it rather, uh, that we have been able to work over the course of years uh, on this project. Um, but um, to this point, we aren't allowed to compensate them. Um, we, um, um, it is against uh, the regulations of the prison to, Compensate people who are um, who are incarcerated, um, and we follow the rules that the prison give us. Um, otherwise, we would lose access to it. Um, and um, I think it's a, it's a really important question. Um, I, I don't, and I can't speak for our students, and I, I wouldn't dare to. Um, I would say my reading of what um, Antonio says at the uh, that that passage that I read from Antonio um, is that this is something that he engaged in. Um, precisely because it provides an opportunity for him to be um, 
to to be um, to act in a way that uh, and, and to be seen in a way that most incarcerated people aren't. Uh, and it, as he says, bucks up against what is expected of him. Um, and so for him, uh, again, I don't want to speak for him, but my reading of that passage is that it's an act of resistance um, and uh, one that is important to his own self identity, um, his ability to. Um, now I can't. I, I can't say what it would be like. I don't know what it's like to be incarcerated for 21 years, like Antonio has been with a life sentence. Um, compensation, uh, if we could, uh, we would do it in a second. And and I think it's important. Um, it's just something that uh, we're prohibited from doing. So um, I appreciate the question. So uh, we're going to have a, a lecture on African personhood and about three weeks, three to four weeks. And um, so the concept of the idea of personhood is something that I think is very relevant in this, in this particular instance, because when you think about individuals that have been incarcerated, and one of the, one of the men said it, you know, uh, we're not seeing, you know, there, there's, uh, you're given a number, you're in some, some ways you're deprived of your name, mm -hmm but you're really deprived of your personhood. And so um, I think that Antonio's statement and, and some of the statements that some of the other men made, this is a way of kind of restoring that personhood. Like people don't see them as people, right? And, and I think when, when we, we talked this summer, you had mentioned when, um, you took the exhibit out that they did and their family members got to see it and people in the public got to see it. And for them, it gave them a real sense of pride, right? Because they did something to contribute um, where people still may not recognize their name, but they know that they did it. And so uncovering the names of these enslaved people in a way was uncovering their own names because you know still people won't recognize them but they've given agency and names to these people who were enslaved who were invisible up to that point i think that's a really uh, a really great way of, of putting it and um I, the the capacity of people uh, behind pars to to do incredible things um uh, I, I don't know that the public at large uh, thinks about that, right? Out of sight, out of mind. That's why prisons are often in rural areas, um, and it's um, uh, like like the men had, had said. Um, you're told when to sleep. You're you're told when to eat. Um, all of these things that in uh, what uh, Mercury referred to as the free world um, we take for granted. Um, that uh, being able to work on this project, um, being able to contribute something to public knowledge, um, to um, address wrongs in the public history of this area. Um, it, uh, I will say that the men uh, in our program uh, who participated in the research, the public history research collective are, are incredibly proud of their work. Um, and I think rightfully so. And I, to, to your point uh, about kind of, um, being able to um, challenge the dehumanization of the prison system to, um, to assert personhood. Um, I think all of those things factor into why someone might decide to spend their time doing this work, um, uncompensated um, hours and hours, straining their eyes, doing, um, doing this work um, um, for all of those reasons. And it, it also seems to be, in a way, life-changing, right? Mm -hmm. To recognize that you can actually do this type of work. You know, you've been incarcerated. There are people saying that you're basically not human. Mm -hmm. But then here you are able to do this work that people who made different choices in life or had different circumstances in life and may have gone, you know, gone to college and gotten degrees, you're able to do that same kind of work, even though you're behind bars. So don't you think that that's kind of uh, mind altering, you know, mm -hmm. life changing? Because I, I looked at the women in the documentary yeah. 
And so you had these women that, you know, they probably, when they went in, they probably had no idea of what they could even do. Mm. But then they come out and you see these three fascinating women doing all this work, getting, you know, master's, doctoral students, you know. Yeah. People don't think that people that go into prison can come out that way, but that's what the prison system is not all about punishment, it's supposed to be about rehabilitation, right? So this, this, these projects really help to transform lives, do they not? So um, I, think, um, I think good history can transform all of our lives mm -hmm. um, and um, whether one is incarcerated or not um, and um, being able to, um, being able to, um, to uh, put yourself into uh, the public conversation and to uh, make assertions based on expertise. Um, I, I think that can be transformative um, for, for all of us. Um, I will say that someone like Antonio certainly did not need me to, to show up uh, in the prison uh, for him to know that uh, that um, in a more just world he would be a graduate student somewhere or uh, 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 a professor or an instructor somewhere. Um, um, there are folks who have engaged in self study for years and years um, before we showed up, uh, right? Um, and so um, I don't want to um, put kind of just this project as being kind of that transformative piece. Um, but I, I will say that there are other folks. Um, and you hear this in college uh, in prison um, um, programs across the country where folks just say, I had no idea I was this smart. I, I, I had no idea that I had the capacity to do this. Um, and so I think it, it really, it, it varies. Um, and um, you know, Antonio speaks a number of languages, um, um, was a, a teacher, a law clerk uh, inside of the prison and had been kind of doing the, the trying to stay active and keep his mind active in ways long before we arrived. Um, and then there are other men um, who um, may have never been um, told that they had the capacity from someone else. Um, and, and that mattered to them. Um, and the history project allowed them to kind of engage in work that um, shaped public thinking in a way that they may not have ever thought that they would have the opportunity to do. All right, so it looks like we're about at time. Uh, if there are any other questions, you can type them in the Q&A right quick. I'm going to show uh, what we'll be doing next week. So the next webinar we'll have will be next Thursday at 6 p.m. Um, the second part of the sentencing project, racial sentencing disparities, female incarceration, and community collateral damages. So we'll be having another discussion um, with um, Darrell Douglas from the sentencing project along with Professor uh, Terry Crawford. So that'll be next Thursday. Um, so if there are no other questions, I want to thank you, Andy, for joining us and giving us this, this wonderful information. Um, it's just, I, 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 every time I think about it, I'm just kind of like blown away with just the enormity of how much it can transform it and change people's lives, um, you know, being able to do this work. Um, so I want to thank you and I want to thank all of our guests for being here and participating and ask, asking questions. Um, so this is all we have for this week. Please join us again and thank you all and have a good night.